So hopefully everybody is having fun with this, but realize that these are not actual genes that are on the human Y chromosome. Ha ha, it was all just for a laugh. Uh, except for the one at the very top. So it's true that there is a gene on the Y chromosome that is what used to be called the testis determining factor. That was the generic name for the gene before anybody actually found out what the identity of that gene was. We knew that somewhere on the Y chromosome there was a gene that causes male development i.e. testis development. So that's the one real gene. Its name, the name of the gene that is the testis determining factor is SRY. Stands for something that you don't need to know right now. Just remember that the Y stands for Y chromosome. It's SR on the Y chromosome. Sex related, say. That's not really what it stands for, but maybe that's an easy way to remember it. So there's one gene on the Y chromosome that's important for males being males. We're going to see later in class, if you don't have it, maybe something goes wrong. It's been a while since we met. A whole weekend has passed. There was a Super Bowl. Some of you may or may not have partaken. So you may be a little bit fuzzy on what we did on Friday. So what was it that we talked about on Friday? It was techniques mainly. So there are a couple techniques that we discussed. We've already talked about fluorescence and C2 hybridizations. PCR. It was PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And also, I heard it. Gel electrophoresis, right. PCR and agarose gel electrophoresis. What was the point of these approaches? What's useful about PCR? You make DNA. How much DNA do you make? Billions of copies of DNA. But how much DNA do you have to start with? Theoretically, you just need one molecule of DNA, one double helix, and you can make billions of copies of it. And that's why DNA forensic technologists from around the world love the ability to, you know, when they send potential criminals a letter in the mail and say, and they include a self-addressed stamped envelope and say, please mail us back if you want to win this sweepstakes or something. And so the convict, or suspect rather, not convict, licks the envelope, seals it, sends it off, and then they extract DNA from the saliva that the perp used to seal the envelope, and then they decide whether or not his, DNA, his or her DNA matches the profile of the DNA found at the crime scene. That actually happens. And that's why PCR is so awesome. It's really sensitive. You can make tons and tons and tons of copies of DNA to analyze from just a few molecules of DNA. That's PCR. Start with a little DNA, make a lot. Agarose gel electrophoresis. Why do we do that technique? What, does, what information do we get about DNA molecules, particularly those that have been produced by PCR, by gel electrophoresing them? Take a piece of jello, you stick the DNA sample in one end, you apply a voltage. Right. So it separates the DNA molecules you add into the gel based on their size. That's what we talked about last time. I'll take a quick little interlude into a couple of points from last class as well, then we'll get back to PCR, gel electrophoresis, and the new material for today. Some of you have pointed out that I made a mistake here. It was a simple mistake because I did not pay attention to my own numerical code. So I accidentally flipped it. So it's, the audio that I recorded over top of this was accurate. What are the types of rearrangements that cause changes in DNA content for sure of the four types? What's definitely going to cause changes in DNA content? Duplication, because you're making more DNA and sticking it into the chromosomes, or a deletion. So duplication and deletion definitely 
cause a change. So those actually should have been connected to one, according to my numerical scheme up there, one being the most likely to cause a change. Whereas inversions and translocations don't necessarily cause any change in the amount of DNA you have in the cell, in the nucleus. They just change where those pieces of DNA are located in the cell. So those really should have been connected down here to least likely in red to cause a change in DNA content. They still can. Those rearrangements can cause changes in DNA content. We're just less sure about it than absolutely, you better believe it, put money on it. Duplication, deletion, it's inherent in their names, causes cause change in DNA content. So if all you do is listen to the audio, my explanation was correct, but those blue lines were swapped. Any questions about exam prep, study guide, the mock exam? Next time we come to class, we're going to do a review session. So at the end of class again today, I'll remind you, bring questions to class next time, because I prepare nothing. You show up and ask me questions, I answer them. So we try to clarify misconceptions. Are paper notes OK on the, on the Yes, you can bring paper notes to the exam. And digital notes, and of course your tablet, et cetera. So the exam works like I pass out a PDF to everybody from Google Classroom. You take it on your tablet. You attach it back to me at the end of the 50 minutes. So I can't stop you from anything, really, using the internet, Wikipedia. The only thing I ask, and I, by the way, I will post by Wednesday the rules for the exam on Friday so everybody knows what's going to happen in advance. One of the things is no audio, even if you have headphones, because headphones was not a required thing for everybody to own, so I can't let those of you that do have headphones bring them to class and use them. So there's no audio. So you can use the internet, you just can't listen to videos, because it's either distracting if you do not have headphones, and it's not fair if you do have headphones if other students don't. So no audio. One rule. But otherwise, it's open internet. Textbook, notes. Wikipedia, Google. Other questions? Yeah. So what's the average on the exam? Is it all that good? Actually, the, exam, the average has been pretty good. But as I mentioned a class or two ago, I do write harder exams. Well, they're not harder in the traditional sense of harder. It's just that there's less, there are less questions on factual recall because you can look up the facts. So why would I test you on that? The point is, we're all 21st century learners now. We've all got this 24-7, wherever we are. So do you think I memorize everything I know about genetics? I look most of it up when I need to. I don't memorize it anymore. And I don't expect you to either. So the factual stuff, I assume you have, or you know where to find it, which means I ask more applied type questions on exams. As far as the averages, They've been about the same as my exams previously. I rate them more difficultly, but they also leverage your ability not to frustrate yourselves about trying to remember or memorize every last thing. You've got that safety net, the tablet. But we'll see how it goes. Other questions? Of course, mechanics, content. Yep. Today's, like, I'll tell you when we stop today's content that will be covered on the exam. So PCR and gel electrophoresis, yes. When we move from that today into the next topic, that will be on the future exam, bioinformatics, DNA sequence analysis using computers. We've got a little bit more content on gel electrophoresis and PCR. Ah. So this is one student submission posted on Google Classroom, asked me, is this the right answer because it doesn't look quite like the answer I posted in the key. So I'd like you to take a second, please, and with a neighbor or by yourself, it doesn't matter. There is an issue with this, a very tiny issue that would cause like a tenth of a point deduction, maybe. What is it? So take a minute. Discuss, think, find the issue. 
Okay. It's really subtle. So don't kick yourself if you don't see it. If I hadn't, it took me a while to catch it. I was just trying to figure out why does this answer not match what I showed on the key. So I spent extra time trying to figure out why what I saw here didn't match. So who has an idea? Sir? Is the polarity in the probe? Is the polarity in what sense? Yes, we have a winner. So remember, when you write a DNA sequence, it's assumed that it's from 5 prime to 3 prime. So how does that not match what's drawn here? There's that same sequence, but it's written with the reverse polarity. So that's why it would be like, a, seriously, a tenth of a point or less deduction. I mean, this, is, this student is showing me they understand what I'm trying to test on. Do all of the base pairs pair appropriately? Yep. Yes. Are all of the strands anti-parallel as shown hybridized? Five prime end next to a three prime end? Yeah. So the important concepts are there. It's just this little tiny little thing. If you read a DNA sequence left to right, it's five prime to three prime. So if we were going to fix this, what would we have to do? It's an easy fix. Well, let's start by changing the polarity of the probe so that it matches what I wrote. Now I've got a cascade of events. What's happened, what happens next? You have to change the polarity of the strand it's hybridized to. Then what do we have to do? You have to change the polarity of all of the other molecules. And now you earned that extra half a point. So this is kind of, I'm just trying to give you an insight a little bit as to what's important to me as an instructor and how I grade. Obviously, every time I ask a question, there's a core concept that I'm trying to assess whether or not you understand it. That's what you get most of the points for. Here it's, yes, is it base pairing and antipolarity of the DNA molecules? You won't know what I'm trying to test, but when you read a question, you can think, hmm. I wonder what the key concept is going to be. Make sure you nail that part. Here, this tiny little nitpicky detail is important, but it's not worth a ton of points. So this is an example of what I'm doing, right. Any question that I write, these things that we do in class when I ask you to do something and exercise, these are questions written by me. I write the exam questions. I don't take them from the textbook or anything. So yeah, it's a good example of the type of question I might write on an exam. Right? It's not something you can Google. It's not something you can look up on Wikipedia. So even though you have access to the internet, the types of questions you're going to see are applied questions. And they're ones I made up. So they don't exist anywhere on the internet. If you need to figure out information, like if you forget what's the normal polarity of DNA when it's written down, you could Google that. And then you'd say, OK, so if it's written A-T-A-C-A-G, that's 5 prime to 3 prime. That's fine. It won't get you to the answer gets you that extra 0.5 percent, 0.5 points. Yeah? So when are you going to test off on things you went over in lecture anyway? It's mainly lecture-specific content that I write exam questions about. So the textbook, as I've mentioned before, I think, if I didn't, forgive me, is more at, for a supplementary tool. So if you don't understand concepts, vocabulary, those sorts of things, you can go look it up in the textbook. But what I think is most important for you to learn is what we talk a lot about in class. That's also what I test on. <laughs> Hopefully that's useful knowledge for everybody. OK, so today, this is the structure of the class. We might not get through all of it, but that's fine. We'll cover more after the exam if we need to. Applying the concepts of PCR and agarose gel electrophoresis. So last time was. Probably very intellectually unsatisfying because it was all theoretical and, and approaches, experimental approaches. Today I want to frame the use of PCR and gel electrophoresis in the context of an actual scientific question. So how do you use information you can get for PCR? And this was stimulated by one of your responses from our Today's Meet entries last class. We started last class. I asked you to look up, I think it was last class, 
inversion, translocation, deletion, type one of those terms into OMIM, and then tell me what sort of human genetic disorders are associated with those sorts of chromosomal rearrangements. And then I saw this, which really hits home, not because I have XY sex reversal, but because sex determination and the genetic basis of sex is just inherently sort of intellectually stimulating to me. So I've come up with today's class based on this comment. So how could a deletion of genetic material lead to XY sex reversal where you have, and so this is the definition uh, in this case of XY sex reversal. You have an XY genotype means you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, so you should be male, but this individual is phenotypically female. So how do you get an individual, a human, who has a Y chromosome but is not male? That's the question. So we're going to try to answer that question by the end of class. We're going to use PCR and agarose gel electrophoresis to figure out the answer. We. The scientists that did the experiments will tell us the answer. So a quick review. How many different fragments of DNA are running down lane A of this gel is drawn? Five. Sure. One, two, three, four. Five different sizes of fragments. Each of those bands is made up of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of individual double helices of DNA that have been produced by PCR. Many molecules, but we call that one band. It shows up as one discrete object on the gel, one band of lots of copies of DNA. So there are five bands, five fragment sizes. What is, I don't remember what the question, let's see. What's the size of the largest fragment in lane A? Right, so here's the largest one because it runs, the larger fragments run the smallest distance from the well to the negative, or the positive terminal rather. DNA is negatively charged, it runs to the right. So that's about 60 whatever, units, usually base pairs, BP, base pairs, or sometimes thousands of base pairs, which is K kilo base pairs. Doesn't matter. 50. Perfect answer. 60. So we don't know what the units are in this drawing. A few more questions, then we get into the really new content. I'm just trying to refresh everybody's memory about how to read a gel. In a few minutes, we're going to see an actual gel from this experiment having to do with mice and moving genes around in males and females, and it's cool. So here's an actual picture of an agarose gel. Not a drawing anymore, not a diagram. So where did the PCR samples get loaded in this image? The top or bottom? So here are the wells. Those are the indent. We're looking straight down on the gel. So those are the indentations in this piece of jello, essentially, where you could add DNA samples. Okay. So the DNA is running, second question, down. The positive terminal is down here. So the DNA was loaded here. It's all migrating towards the bottom. Positive terminals at the bottom, then the negative terminal is at the top of the gel. Any questions about any of this? Yes? Ah, oh, fired some darker than others, some of the bands, right? Okay. So we have some that are very faint here. These ones are a little bit brighter. Fainter. Oh, you had to ask a really complicated question. So the short answer is 
Well, you tell me. Why would a band be darker or brighter? Sure, different amounts of DNA. That's the most obvious answer anyway. Now, the real question is, why would there be different amounts of DNA in all of these different wells? And that is where the answer gets really complicated. We talk about how efficient different PCR reactions are and so forth, it gets very technical. So for our intents and purposes, when you see a band, we just assume, and this is true for practicing geneticists. In my lab, we do PCR all the time. I'm always telling my students, don't worry about how bright the band is. We just want to know, is it there or is it not? And what size is it? So if you can see it, it's a band. And then you just want to know how big is it. Excellent question. Others? Yeah. The bands on the left, are those the known sizes? Ah, thank you. M for marker, or MW for molecular weight standard? Absolutely. Now, what any good scientist would have done, I'm not saying I'm not a good scientist, but if I were a good scientist, I would have told you what the sizes of those bands are. Because without me telling you that, you have no idea what the scale is you're looking at. In this case, this looks like a gel that we ran in my lab. So I know that those bands that I've drawn up there are 1,500, 1,000, and 500 base pairs long, for example. So normally, if I show you a gel, I will include that information. So what's the largest fragment of DNA on this gel? Experimental, sorry. Yes, the largest fragment is 1,500. That's in the molecular weight ladder. For the other, the red lanes, what's the large fragment? Yeah, it's like, it's a good assumption to make. Each one of those bands is an additional 100 base pairs, 500, 600, 700, 800. So it's about 800, 900, 850 base pairs. Don't stress the details. If you tell me 846 base pairs, you'll get 100%. If you tell me 837, you get 100%. No right answer. It's just an approximation. It's a guess. If you told me 300, you wouldn't get points. 850, 870, you understand the concept. That's what I'm looking for. Someone was closer to the marker. So let's see, we've got these ones? Yeah. Okay, so those are what size? Like 650? They're somewhere in between the 700 and 600 base pair bands. Oh, the terminals? Yeah. Okay, so when this gel is run, we have a voltage supply, and we connect one lead to one end of the box that this gel is sitting in, and that has a negative charge. And we connect the, end of the other end of this gel to a positive charge, and that's the force that pushes the DNA through the gel. So DNA being negatively charged goes this direction, towards the positive end of the gel. And we know that smaller fragments run farther down the gel faster than larger fragments. Oh, okay. I thought it was the other way around. That, I thought it was more horizontal and not vertical. Ah, so, ah, yes. Yeah, so it's important, first thing you should always do when you look at a gel, because sometimes these will be rotated 90 degrees, 180 degrees. How are you going to read? How are you going to interpret the gel? So what's the first thing you do when you see a gel to orient yourself? Location of the wells. So if they're on the top, then DNA is going to run down. If they're on the left side, DNA is going to run to the right. If I happen to do this upside down, then the DNA is going to run to the top. So it's always going to be moving from the wells into the picture. Great question. Good to clarify that. (laughs) 
What if you can't see the wells? Then you focus on this. That tells you which direction the gel's running. The bigger fragments are going to be closer to the wells. The small fragments in the ladder will be farther from the wells. OK. So how would a geneticist use a question? OK, so how do we use PCR in genetics? <coughs> Why is it important to know the sizes of PCR products? That's the only information we get out of PCR. How big is the piece of DNA? So here's an example. I asked you to think about this hypothetical scenario where I give you corn that's transgenic and corn that's not, and I want you to tell me the difference. How would you do that with PCR? One of these ears of corn, the chromosomes have the addition of a herbicide resistance gene. So the farmer can spray herbicide all over the crops, kill just the weeds, and not kill the corn plants. Yeah. Please do. Go ahead. OK, so we were going to look for a difference in size. Perfect. And that's because, well, why is it longer? We've added something to the chromosome. The scientist has added a gene to a chromosome. That's going to make that chromosome longer. Right. So here's a chromosome of non-GMO corn. And here's a chromosome of GMO corn. Where here, it doesn't have to look like a loop. I'm just doing this for another purpose that will become clear in a minute. This is extra DNA that carries that gene. So that GMO, the genetically modified organism chromosome, is a little bit longer. It's got one extra gene than the normal corn plant has. So how does this help us distinguish the two using PCR? Well, an important thing to realize is that the only difference, potentially, between the GMO and the non-genetically modified corn is that one addition. Otherwise, the two chromosomes, in theory, have exactly the same sequence, the GMO and the non-GMO, identical. No differences, just the difference of this one gene. In other words, if we drew some sequence from elsewhere on the chromosomes, they'd look identical. How does this help us perform PCR to detect a change in size of the chromosome? So step one, what do we need for performing PCR? We've got chromosomes that we're going to make copies of. What else do we design? We need to make primers. So we want to have primers that are going to make lots of copies of part of the chromosome. So let's make primers that take advantage of the fact that both of the chromosomes, the non-GMO and the GMO, are identical at this spot on the chromosome. So we toss any sort of chrome DNA into a PCR reaction with these primers. What's the relative size of the products that are produced by the GMO and the non-GMO chromosomes? Which one's bigger? GMO. By how much? Yeah, however long that extra piece of DNA that was inserted was. So the size of the PCR product produced there would maybe be that long, left to right. And because the non-GMO doesn't have that extra gene, the same primers, I'll diagram them here too, aren't as far apart on the gene, on the chromosome, as they are in the GMO organism. These primers, the same DNA sequences are separated by a longer distance because somebody stuck that extra gene in between where the primers base pair with the chromosomes. So now what do we have to do if we're going to detect which sample is GMO? Right. 
you run a gel. This is why, this is a case where knowing the size of the PCR product tells you something about the organism you're studying. Bigger product, GMO. Smaller product, not. Before we get there, let's draw what that actually looked like. Go ahead. So what if you already knew that the gene was taken from another animal? Couldn't you just run like the DNA of the animal and see if that band matches up? Or you can't mm. do that. So we've got a good question up here. Let's do this first, and then I'll answer your question. So we'll do two side-by-side -side gels. Wells at the top. So let's say these are the GMO and non-GMO wells. Tell me what these look like based on the previous slide, where the primers are, the size products they produce. So let's say here's non-GMO. That's the size of band that was produced by that PCR reaction. So how do we draw what's present in the genetically modified organism's lane? Its fragments are bigger or smaller than non? They should be bigger. Of course, you don't know in advance what you've loaded in each well. That we're, that's what we're trying to figure out. You don't know which well has the GMO and the non-GMO samples. So doing this the other way, say you see this gel, how do you interpret it? It's the exact opposite logic. The larger band belongs to the GMO organism. The smaller one belongs to a non-GMO organism. Now, I'm going to answer a version of the question that many of you probably didn't answer here, from up front here. I'm going to do a variety of the a version of the question. So not to answer it directly, but sort of indirectly. There are two differences between the GMO and the non-GMO chromosome. We just took advantage of one difference. What was that? Difference in size. What's the other genetic difference between the GMO and the non-GMO chromosomes? What's another way we could detect whether or not you were GMO or non-GMO? We could do size. It's related to sequence. But it's, so you're absolutely correct. There's going to be a difference in the sequence of the two chromosomes. The GMO has the presence of the gene we're looking for. And the other chromosome does not have that gene. So instead of this, where we use the same pair of PCR primers to amplify the same region of the chromosome and look for a size difference, what if instead we used primers that would only make copies of the gene we're looking for? <coughs> So what we, this experiment, the gel on the left, is using those primers. We're trying to detect the difference in size. PCR can also be used to detect presence or absence. So what happens if we apply red primers to the non-GMO chromosome? We put non-GMO corn DNA chromosomes in. We put the red primers in that only recognize this transgene the new gene that's been added. What happens when we run that on the gel? The non-GMO Right. You don't get any PCR product created because those primers that only bind to the gene don't have a gene in that chromosome to bind to, so you don't get any product. You get no band. Those poor red primers try to anneal, they try to anneal, they try to anneal to something so that DNA polymerase can come in and make copies of the DNA, but to no avail because the sequence they would base pair with doesn't exist in that organism. But when you do the same 
hybridization fish experiment using the red primers on a GMO organism, then you'll see a band. So two different approaches to get the same piece of information. One depends on, one relies on there being a difference in size between the two chromosomes. That's on the left. The other tests for presence or absence of the thing that you're looking for. So there's a binary answer, yes or no. Does the word modified in GMO only ever mean an addition of a gene? Not at all, and I do not mean to, I do not mean to imply that a genetically modified organism always has an addition of genetic information. Sometimes it's deletion, sometimes it's humans doing what they do best and growing crops for years and years and selecting for ones that give you bigger fruit, which is a form of genetic modification, in my opinion. We'll talk a lot about that at the end of the term as well. We talk about GMOs. Please. Which technique would you use for the gender differences? Because if they were the same size, then you wouldn't be able to determine a difference in the left one. Right. So if there's no difference in size, then you wouldn't see a difference in the band patterns. There's an issue don't have time to go into it right now, unfortunately. There's an issue with using the approach on the right. It's not as scientifically sound as using the approach on the left. And we'll talk about that more in detail as we go through the semester. It basically has to do with when you don't see something. So here's the, here's the concept. I'm going to let it slide after that. But think about this. If you set up a PCR reaction, you run it out on an agarose gel, and you don't see anything, what can you conclude from that? So think about that. So let's, I'm going to skip this bioinformatics part for now and get to the end of the set of slides. We'll do a lot more with this after the exam. Okay, here's the good stuff. The human X and Y chromosomes, right? We saw this figure at the beginning of class. There's the test determining factor, which is called SRY. It's found at the very top of the Y chromosome. Which arm is that? It's the P arm, the petite short arm. Okay. There's the X chromosome. It's huge. So you've got the X chromosome, which, by the way, is submetacentric. It's not called the X chromosome because it's shaped like an X. That's a whole other thing. Okay. So SRY is the gene that causes maleness in mammals. So that's all the information you have. So what do you think is going to happen here? You take this phenotypically female mouse, vagina, ovaries, the whole nine yards. She does not contain a Y chromosome. She does not contain the SRY gene. So she's female. What would her sex be if we had artificially introduced, like GMO corn, the SRY gene into her chromosomes at fertilization. So she grew up from the single cell embryo, she had SRY the whole time. What would her phenotype be? Would she be male or female? That's not the phenotype, right? Phenotype. So does she look, does she, he or she develop as male or female? Male. Because? Right. So if you put the testis determining factor, SRY, just that gene, into a female, you might expect that that would cause a genetically female embryo to develop as a male. Because you put in the gene that triggers maleness. Do you believe me? Maybe, maybe not. Well, here's the proof, such as it is. 
So it's a little bit dark. Hopefully, it's a little bit brighter on your tablets. Okay, what are we looking at? It's agarose gel. We've got a marker lane. And we've got <coughs> PCR performed on mouse number 33.17. So scientists had a lot of mice that they numbered them for ease of reference. XY male, expected or not? Does that make sense? Y chromosome, male. Okay. This lane contains, as it says over here on the right by the bracket, PCR products from three separate pairs of primers. So they've taken mouse 33.17's DNA, extracted it, and done three different PCR reactions. It's looking at three different genes. What's the top gene? SRY. So there's a band there. What does that tell us about this mouse? The primers that were designed to the SRY gene generated a product, hence this mouse has the SRY gene in his chromosomes, hence it makes sense that he's male. Right? SRY gene, male. So this mouse is phenotypically male, dangling by his tail, see a penis. And he's genetically male. He has the right gene. He's got SRY. The control band is a PCR reaction using primers that detect a totally separate gene. They didn't even bother to tell us what the gene is because the name of the gene is not important. This is a positive control. That's supposed to be a plus. That means that you do this experiment to make sure that the PCR works at all. This has nothing to do with sex. It's a control experiment. We expect it to show up every time they do PCR. What's with this ZFY1 gene? It's the third gene that they PCR. Where is it located? Look at the ideogram on the right. ZFY. What chromosome is it on? Y. Only the Y. There's a different version of this gene called ZF. X, because of course that one's on the X chromosome. So why do they do this PCR reaction for the ZFY1 gene? What does that tell us about this mouse? SRY told us that he was, should be male. What additional information does ZFY1 PCR tell us? There's a band there, so it means this mouse has ZFY1. So these scientists are using this PCR as evidence that there's a Y chromosome. So ZFY1 is another gene, but it's also on the Y chromosome, much like SRY. So that PCR is testing for the presence or absence of the Y chromosome. Does that make sense? So if you've got the Y chromosome, you should get a band for ZFY PCR. What would happen if you did this, did this PCR with an XX female? So draw in what you think the banding pattern would look like. Here's an another, another example of what a test question might look like. And we'll wind up in the next three minutes. Get you out of here at 11.50. So what bands will be produced by PCR if you use SRY, control, and ZFY primers? On a female. Just a control. So definitely we'll have the control band. That's why it's a control. It'll work with every PCR reaction. Does a normal female have SRY? No. Does a normal female have ZFY? No, she has ZFX, but that's not what we're doing. We're looking for the presence of ZFY. Okay. So we should expect in a normal female to see one band. Huh. Lo and behold, that's what the scientists see. So now they've done control experiments. They've taken a normal male and a normal female, and they've seen what the pattern of bands is. So a normal male will have three bands corresponding to those three genes. Normal female will just have the control band. OK, so here was the experiment. This made these scientists famous. 
discovering that, Z, that SRY really is the gene that causes maleness. They took a normal XX individual, as it suggests down here at the bottom, so it should be female, they added one copy of the SRY gene. So we already discussed what the prediction might be, but what do you predict that agarose gel will look like? An XX individual that has SRY, what bands should be present? Well, if we put SRY in, there better be an SRY band. Is there going to be a control band? Yes. What about ZFY1? Because, no because, she doesn't have a Y chromosome. All she has is SRY. And lo and behold, that's what they found, which is what they expected. So down here at the bottom, last question, then we'll talk about what to do for next class. Why does this pattern of PCR fragments products let the authors conclude that they've made a male mouse that does not have a Y chromosome? The conclusion of these authors was the SRY gene is important in male sex determination. It's not anything else on the Y chromosome. It's just this gene that turns an XX individual into a male. So how do we know that that 33.13 mouse, the one on the right, doesn't have a Y chromosome accidentally? Because there is no ZFY1 band. That was the reaction, the PCR that the authors were using to test. Is there a Y chromosome there? Is there a Y chromosome there? It's present in every male they look at. It's present in no females they look at. It's also not present in this XX individual. That is, when you let it dangle from a bar, you can see its genitalia, male. So they made the first transgenic mice that demonstrated something about SRY, which is what? You take a gene, you put it in an individual that doesn't already have it. That proves that SRY is is it necessary or sufficient? It's sufficient. It's all you need. The addition of one gene they just showed us. You put SRY in an XX mouse. It's sufficient. It's all you need to make a male mouse. OK. So next time, come to class with questions. We'll talk about the exam.